please remain standing if you would. And turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 8. We want to continue in the um, study of God's word as we learn about our sanctification. In Romans chapter 8, the very first line really is going to describe what Paul will be talking about in the whole chapter, and that is that we are not condemned. We find ourselves in Romans chapter 8 in verses 5 through 11. Let's read that together. And the title I've given this is Walking According to the Holy Spirit. Let's look at this together. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 reads this way. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. But the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. And so we see that the Word of God is filled with promises, isn't it? And that's what we cling to, beloved Remember that it doesn't matter about when it comes to uh, man's works, God's promises do not change, and we cling to those things. Well, let's pray and ask God to speak to us this morning as we look at his word together. Father, I thank you so much that you have brought us out this morning. I pray that you would please uh, speak to us, dear Father. I pray that you would encourage us and strengthen us, for your word is true. Father, we are so thankful that we can truly uh, rely completely in your truth, in your word. And we, Lord, we can um, uh, take comfort in the promises of your word. And now I pray that you would comfort, that you would strengthen. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would allow me to be your messenger this morning. And now, Father, may you speak to us. We beseech you, we thank you, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. As you know, we've been going through the book of Romans, and the book of Romans starts off to show us uh, who we are, or really mankind. And, and uh, if you really look at the book of Romans, it really is an exposition on the gospel, isn't it? And the theme of Romans is the righteousness of God. And so we see that Paul begins in the book of Romans in, in chapters 1 to 3 to show that every person has sinned against God. Every man needs a Savior. And in, all the way from 3 all the way to, to um, uh, chapters uh, 5 and 6, it shares with us that, uh, that a man or woman is saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and we are justified through faith alone. And so we've seen now in Romans 7 and 8, what's the result of all of that? There is a result of that, and that is that we are forgiven, that we are saved, that we've been given a new life. We have been now united with Christ. We have died with Him, we're buried and resurrected with Him in a new life. So if you are redeemed and you know Christ, you have been united with Christ, and you have a new life and a new heart. And Paul emphasizes that here in chapter 8. Let's go back to chapter 8 and verse 1, just to give you a little bit of a background. And Paul makes a very wonderful, wonderful statement in chapter 8, verse 1. And that is, if you are redeemed and you know Christ as your Savior and as your Lord, what is the result of that, of your salvation? Chapter 8, verse 1, therefore, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. This is God's judgment. And when God looks at you and I who are redeemed, who put our faith in Christ, 
He sees that we are justified. He sees us in, in his son. We are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And you know, even though we are Christians and we fall short and we sin and we, we, are, we don't live a perfect life, we can never, we can never be condemned. Because this is God's final judgment on every redeemed individual. So, beloved, understand this, that when we stand before God, even though we might, um, again, we don't have a perfect life, but we are not condemned. And in God's courtroom, we stand justified because of Christ and his sacrifice. So there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set you free. We're no longer under the authority of the law, but rather we are now under Christ. Here it says the law of the spirit of life. We've been given to it. We're under another authority, and that is under the Lord, under the law of the spirit. Look at verse 3. For what the law could not do, weak as, as it was through, through the flesh, God did. In other words, when God gave us the law, we could never meet God's perfect law. We could never meet that. I mean, think about just the Ten Commandments, right? How many of us perfectly honored our mother and father? How many of us perfectly did that? I don't think anyone perfectly. That's just one commandment. And we're to honor our mother and father. And so we learn then that we were, we were, um, we have fallen short of God's, uh, of God's commandment. We have sinned against the Lord. And it says in verse three, for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, and that was us, we could not meet that perfect standard God did for us, didn't he? by sending Christ, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And notice it says likeness because Christ had no sin. He is sinless. He is the divine son of God, the second person in the Trinity, God Almighty in the flesh. He was sinless. He came in the form of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Why? Because that's how sin came into the world. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in who? In us. Isn't that amazing? Because we have been united with Christ, Christ fulfilled the law. Now that we've been united with Christ, we have, been, we have fulfilled the law through Christ. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh. This is an important part because this leads right into the sermon here in verses 5 through 11. Not only are we declared justified, not only are we in Christ and we have fulfilled the law in Christ, but listen, listen to the last part of verse 4. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. If you have been redeemed and you are born again, you are in the Spirit now. You're no longer in the unregenerate flesh. You're no longer the old person, but now you're in the spirit. And now Paul begins to share with us what it's like to walk in the spirit. In verses 5 through 8, if you have your, uh, your outlines there in the bulletin, in verses 5 through 8, he begins to share the contrast between walking in the spirit and walking in the flesh. If you are redeemed and you are born again, you are walking in the spirit. Not perfectly, right? Because we fall short. But understand, there's a change of heart. There's a change of mind. There's a change of direction. There's a change in your affections. There's a change in your path and your purpose. And so he began to share with us, there's a contrast. And then verses 9 through 10, he began to share with us that the Holy Spirit now lives in us. That's really important, isn't it? We have the eternal abiding Holy Spirit in us now. We have been born again from on high. And then finally in verse 11, Paul shares with us the commitment, the pledge, the down payment that we have through the Holy Spirit of Christ. Let's look at the contrast very quickly. The contrast here. Paul shares with us that walking in the flesh is completely different than walking in the spirit. Walking in, of course, he's talking about those who are not saved, the unregenerate. Look at verses 5 through 8. Paul goes on to say, For those who are according to the flesh, these are people who are unsaved, these are people who do not know the Lord, 
those who are according to the flesh set their minds on things above. Is that what it says? They set their mind on things of the flesh. You have to understand that a person who is not saved and doesn't know the Lord, they are just trying to, they are all about themselves. They are about uh, fulfilling their own desires of their flesh. Even though they might be religious, ultimately it's about them. You know, it's almost like a beast, right? And I look at my dogs, and I and I, you look at my, and I look at my dogs, and I'm thinking, what are they all about? They're all about food, right? <laughs> they want to be petted, and then they want food, and, and so they have. That's their agenda. That's their purpose. And so, beloved, we learn that when we meet other people in the street. You ask them, what is your purpose in life? And a lot of people just think about physical things all the time, right? Their thinking doesn't go beyond this life. They don't think about eternity. They don't think about God. They, they just think about maybe their job and about what's around them and what they see. And that's it. And so, beloved, when it comes to the flesh, they set their minds on things of the flesh. And we saw that in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. That's what sinful man is all about. And so the mindset on the flesh is all about the flesh. But, verse 5, those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit... You and I, we think about, hopefully, much more than this. We think about our time that we're going to be with the Lord. Someday we'll stand before Almighty God. We think about our new body that God will give us someday. We think about our loved ones that we're going to see someday. So those who are redeemed, who are in the Spirit, we think about things above, don't we? Look at verse 9. For the mindset on the flesh is what? It's just death. That's all it is. And that's all it leads to. But the mind set on the, on the spirit is life and peace. Why? Because we've been right with God. We are now clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We have peace with God. And we know through the Lord we have eternal life. And so we have this assurance. And the assurance is based upon God's word. And so we have this peace. And we have this promise of life. And that's the mindset on the, on the spirit. Look at verse 7. Because a mindset on the flesh, what kind of person is that? Is hostile. Isn't that amazing? The mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. You ever wonder why that is? Because when a person looks at God's word and God's truth and they look at Christ and how we call them to repentance... The mind of the flesh, they only want to fulfill the things of the flesh. They only want their own desires. Again, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. And when you begin to bring the commandments of the Lord and begin to call people to repentance, you're standing in their way. And God's word is in their way of their own agenda. And their own agenda is their own lusts. And so when it comes to God, they are hostile towards God. They are enemies of the Lord. Because the mindset in the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God. Not only can it not subject itself, it says, for it is not even able to do so. So a person that is not saved, doesn't know the Lord, we see that they are in darkness. They are in darkness. And unless God reaches down into their darkness and delivers them, they cannot be saved. So not only do they not subject themselves to God's word, to God's law, but they're not even able to do so unless God acts upon them. Verse 8, and those who are in the flesh, they cannot please God. You know, it's amazing because if you remember when Paul went to Philippi, and when he went there, there was not a synagogue there because it shows you they didn't have enough Jewish men. So Paul began to, uh, you know, it was a Sabbath day, and he went out to the outskirts of Philippi near a river uh, where people would worship. And he found some ladies there. Remember this story? He found some ladies there. And one of the ladies that were there, her name was Lydia. And there, and there Paul began to preach Christ to her and to the women. And you know what the Bible says? This is so important. 
The Bible says that God opened her heart. God opened her heart. It doesn't say Lydia opened her own heart. God opened her heart. God broke into her darkness and let her see the light of the gospel to understand that she's a sinner. She needs to repent and to trust in Christ for eternal life and forgiveness of sin. God opened her heart and she got saved. And beloved, understand this, that when we go and we share the gospel, we can't save anybody. God needs to open their heart. God needs to draw them. And so we see here then that uh, when it comes to the mindset and the flesh, only God can open their heart. What we need to do is simply share the gospel. We have to get the gospel right. And so verses 5 through 8, you see this contrast, right, between the mindset of the flesh and the mindset of the spirit. And again, if you are redeemed and you are born again, you are in the spirit of God. Just like we're in Christ, we're in the spirit. The flesh spoken about here again is the unregenerate flesh. It's the unsaved versus the redeemed. There are two different mindsets, aren't there? Two different hearts, two different motives, two different desires, two different paths. Because we have a new life, beloved. You and I who are saved, who are born again, who are redeemed, we have a new life. We have a new heart. We have a new love. We have a new purpose. At least you should. You're right. There should be a transformation. If you say, well, pastor, I really don't, you know, nothing has really changed. And you need to really question to see whether you are truly saved. Because remember, it's not just modifying your behavior. It's being born again and transformed. Go with me to Acts 9. We looked at this before, but I want you to see this again. I want you to see a change. And I think that Paul is a very good example of that. And again, I did use this before, but I just can't help it because it's such a great, a great change, a 180 degree change of Saul, the persecutor of the church. In Acts chapter 9, look at verse 10. We learn that Jesus broke into Saul's darkness. Please understand this. Saul did not wake up that morning and say, today I want to be saved. Paul was breathing threats. And he had murder in his heart against God's people. And then Jesus appeared to him on the Damascus road and said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And it dawned on Saul that he was fighting against God and that Jesus truly is the Messiah, the King of Israel, the Son of the living God. And for three days, Saul was blinded and was fasting. Look at Acts chapter 9, verse 10. And it says here in verse 10, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in the vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. I truly believe that in those three days that Paul, or back then was called Saul, was repenting. Verse 12. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Verse 13, but Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, it reminds me of Moses, right? Moses had all these excuses. Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him said, and listen to this, Brother Saul, isn't that interesting? does it say, uh, Mr. Saul, <laughs> Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized. And he took food and was strengthened. 
And so we see then that, that here is Saul, and he was praying. He knew that he was fighting against God. He realized that Jesus is truly the Messiah of Israel. And now that he understood the truth, something happened. Something happened to him. God gave Saul a new heart. God gave Saul a new love, a new purpose, a new path. Look at verse 19. So he took food and was strengthened. Now for several days, he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. Remember that? And immediately, what did he do? He began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is a son of God. All those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, is this not he who, who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? But, call, but Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. What happened? God gave Saul a new heart. God gave him a new life. Beloved, you need to understand that when God has saved you and has saved us, we confess Christ, don't we? When a person says, I'm saved, I'm born again, and they don't confess Christ, I don't think they're saved. Because one of the evidences of a, of a person that has, has trusted in Christ and has been born again is they confess him. They confess him to others. Do you remember when you first got saved? Do you remember when you got excited and you heard about Christ and, and, and you learned that you are forgiven of your sins? You couldn't wait to tell other people. That was Saul. You see, it shows you that he had a new life and a new heart and a new love. And the sign of a true convert is that they confess Christ publicly. So, beloved, it's important for us to understand this. And we see that those who are in the Spirit, their mindset are on things of the Spirit, not on the things of the flesh. In fact, we have a whole new mind. Go with me to 1 Corinthians, would you? 1 Corinthians 2. So, I want to encourage you because... We run into too many people who say, I'm a Christian, but they're not confessing Christ. They need to do that. They need to tell others. Now, they're not going to go out and preach like Saul. Saul went out and became a preacher, didn't he? An apostle. I'm not saying that, but there should be clearly a fruit, a new heart, a new life, a new direction. There should be a transformation in that person's life. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse 12. What does it say about having the mind of Christ? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, that's what we had, but the spirit who is from God. See that? So that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in the words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But the natural man, this is the unredeemed man, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. For they are what? They are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. Have you ever gone and shared with someone the gospel? You talk to them about Christ, and to them they, see, they think you're a nut? They're like, that has nothing to do with it. They don't even want to hear it. It's almost like, why are you wasting my time? And the truth is, beloved, they are in darkness. They can't even see it. They don't even want to see it. They don't want to hear it. In fact, they're hostile towards God. And so when they hear the truth of the gospel, to them it is foolishness. I remember a, a man I was serving under, and he had his own business, and he was successful. He had his own dry cleaning business, and he went to seminary to be a pastor, and he gave up his business to become a pastor. And his, his father, who didn't know the Lord, said, Son, I think you're being extremely foolish. He did not understand that this man wanted to have an eternal impact, but he only, only saw the things of the world. 
Really? Do you think that having riches is really the answer? Having the money and being successful, is that really the answer? Is that going to make you happy? Then why are these people killing themselves? Why are they in self-destruction? You know why? Because they need the Lord. They need true purpose. They need that relationship with the true and living God. And so when we share with people the things of the Spirit, they see these things as foolishness. They cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. Look at verse 15. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is not appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we, listen to this, we have the mind of Christ. Isn't that amazing? God has given us a new heart, a new mind, and even a new purpose and a new love, and that is to live for the Lord and to honor him. We see that we have to walk by the Spirit. Go with me to Galatians 5. You guys know this already. Galatians 5, verse 16. Now understand this, if you are redeemed and you know the Lord, does that mean you have no sin? No, remember the presence of sin is still with us. It's still around us, it's still a battle. And we learned that, uh, that Paul is sharing with the Galatian church, a lot of them were waffling, these Judaizers that come in and begin to talk to them about following the law, and Paul is saying, look, we're not here to follow the law. We've been delivered from that, from the power of the law. But he says to them that they need to learn to walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5, verse 16. Paul says, but I say, Galatians 5, 16, walk in the Spirit. How does a person walk in the Spirit? What does that mean? Well, we know that he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And to walk by the Spirit has to do with a consistency, right? The way we live our life. And what is the Holy Spirit written for us? The Word of God. So to walk by the Spirit is to walk in obedience to the Word of God. It's to submit ourselves to God's Word and to submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit. That is obedience to the Lord. That's what it means to walk in the Spirit, beloved. It's not something mystical, but rather if you know God's Word, you know God's truth, you know the right things to do, then walk in obedience. Do you understand that walking obedience to the Lord means you walk in submission? And that's what it means, beloved, to walk by the Spirit. I say walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. If you're consumed by honoring God and pleasing God and seeking the Lord and filling your mind with God's truth, you're not going to have time for nonsense. Verse 17, for the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit. If you're not filling your mind with truth, if you're not uh, practicing the Word of God, you know what? Something else is going to take over. You ever seen those radio programs? Um, one of those, and when you look at, when you listen to radio programs, they have, some of them, sometimes they, they fall into some problem, they have dead air. Right? And that costs money. You know, you have to understand that, um, that you and I, we can't, we can't afford to be, un, you know, to just be kind of not doing anything. We need to be filling our heart and our mind with God's truth. We need to be always uh, either in prayer or in the word, or in fellowship, we need to keep busy for the things of God, pleasing the Lord. And it says in verse 17, for the flesh sets his desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things, listen to this, that you please. What do you mean? In other words, you do the things that please God. It's not always what you want to do. We live our life to please God, beloved. It's not what you want to do. Verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident. We just looked at the contrast, right? This is not an exhaustive list, but understand this, that when you look at this, let me tell you, we get very, very convicted. The deeds of the flesh are evident, which are what? Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, 
outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, as Paul says. If this, is, if this clearly is describing your lifestyle or your walk, what does Paul say? I forewarn you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. What Paul is saying, if this is describing your lifestyle, you're not saved. You're not saved, friend. You need to repent and get right with God. And so we have to understand that this is what we repent from. This is what the flesh looks like. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. Now look at verse 24. This is talking about the redeemed. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus, what have they done? See the word crucified? That's in the arrow's tense. That means it's once for all time. Once for all time. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. And so, beloved, there needs to be a clear change and a transformation. Again, I'm not talking about perfection, but there needs to be a clear change of direction, clear change of heart and purpose and path. Verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Very important. And so, beloved, we see the contrast now. To walk according to the Spirit is to live a life that's pleasing to God. So let me ask you a simple question. Has your life been transformed? Can you honestly say, Pastor, I used to live this way and my heart was this way, but now my heart is different. Here's the bottom line. Do you love the Lord? See, a person that's not saved, they don't love the Lord. They don't love the Lord. Because if you love the Lord, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So when you see a person that's not walking in obedience, that's a person that doesn't love the Lord. That's really the scale, isn't it? Right? You know, you go on a scale. I just went on a scale the other day. I was like, oh, that's not good. <laughs> but the scale that, that, that weighs your love for Christ is your obedience. So you want to, you wonder, well, how much do I love the Lord? How obedient are you? Because that's what weighs that. Jesus said, Jesus said if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Love and obedience are a two-sided coin. Let me ask you, are you a different person? Do you love the Lord? That's important for us to ask ourselves, isn't it? And if you find that, that you don't, then you need to confess that to the Lord. You need to get right with God. Now let's go back to Romans 8. So we see then there's a contrast when it comes to those who are in the flesh and those who have a new heart, those who are in the spirit. And so what you find in verse 9 is Paul now begins to address the Roman church again and says to them, but when it comes to you guys, he said, you guys are saved. He gives them assurance because I'm sure that when Paul speaks, they get very alarmed. So in verse 9, what does Paul say to them? However, you, you are not in the flesh. But in the spirit, in other words, you are saved. And of course, only God knows every individual. But uh, he's speaking to them as a whole. He says, you guys are saved. You guys are the redeemed. You guys are the church of Christ. So however, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. That's a person that's born again of the spirit of God. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. See the word dwell? You get the word house from that. The key word is how it means someone who literally lives in you. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. One of the evidence, beloved, that we are truly saved and born again and redeemed is the Holy Spirit of God lives in us. We are the temple of God, aren't we? 
can you imagine every one of you having the Spirit of God living in you? And uh, we worship God individually, but when we come together to worship, there's a crescendo, you know. So we should already be worshiping God and in prayer and loving the Lord every single day of our life. But when we come together, it is special, isn't it? Now all these individuals filled with God's Spirit, loving the Lord, now we come together and we worship God. This is what God has prescribed for us to do. And so we see then that if Christ is in you, verse 10, if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. So a part of us has died, hasn't it? We're no, no longer under bondage. Our, our, our body is dead to sin. And so we are alive to Christ. So Paul is assuring the church in Rome that they are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. They are redeemed. Only people who are justified by faith have the permanent and dwelling Holy Spirit of God inside of them, dwelling in them. Now, what's interesting here is that you see that often it'll say the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ used interchangeably because they're the same. And so it's important that we understand that. So we see then that God's Spirit lives in us. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6. We are the temple of God, aren't we? And you know, it's, it's comforting, but at the same time, understand this. What you see and what you do, the Holy Spirit is right there, right next to you. And there are probably places you shouldn't be taking the Holy Spirit, right? Or looking at things the Holy Spirit should not be looking at. You understand that? He's with you. He's right there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. What does it say? Paul says, all things are lawful for me. And he's talking about, of course, his, um, his liberty. But not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered uh, by anything. And Paul is mentioning the, the, the mindset of the day. Food is for the stomach and a stomach for food, but he says, but God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality. See, that was the mindset of the Greeks. They thought, hey, you know, being immoral and being with the person is like eating food. It's just, you know, it's just a desire and a, and a, and a need I have. No, Paul says, no, it's, it's not that way. Um, in fact, it's, it's different when it comes to those who are redeemed. And so he says, God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord. Our body is a temple of God. It is for the Lord. It is surrendered to the Lord. That's what Paul says in uh, Romans 12, right? To give our bodies as a living sacrifice. So the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. Now, God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. Very important. Verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are what? Members of Christ. Your body belongs to the Lord. You know, it's like when a person gets married, right? And, and, and some of you need to be reminded of this. Husbands, when you marry your wife, wives, when you marry your husband, you give your body to them. Your body belongs to your spouse. And your spouse be body belongs to you, Right? And therefore, you need to understand that when you married each other, you gave yourself away to one another. And guess what? When you accepted Christ, you gave yourself away to Christ. You belong to Christ. He purchased you, not with silver or gold, but with his precious blood. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? So shall I t uh, then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? And that, that's what was going on, by the way, in Corinth. They literally had temple prostitutes for these false gods. And some of the people there, the Christians were thinking, well, it's not a big deal. Hey, you know, it's not big. It's like eating food. You know, it's not a big deal. No, it's a big deal. Your body belongs to Christ. And so Paul is saying, shall I then take the member or this body that's Christ 
and, and become a member, make uh, them members of a prostitute? And he says, it shall never be. Verse 16, or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. So, beloved, our bodies are holy temples of God. Verse 18, flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside of his body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? <coughs> if you're saved and you're born again, you belong to the Lord. And this is how we need to conduct ourselves. For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. So, beloved, please understand this. Yes, the Holy Spirit is living in you. You belong to Christ. And so you have to be careful what you're doing with the body of the Lord. Because you are holy and you've been set apart. We are the temple of God, aren't we? We are the temple of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, go with me there. You're in 1 Corinthians, go to 2 Corinthians. Once again, just to reemphasize that the Holy Spirit lives in us. So, number one, we, if we are truly saved and born again, we confess Christ, don't we? We confess Christ. We have a whole different mindset, a whole different life, a whole different heart. And then finally, we are, and second of all, we have the Holy Spirit living in us. We're not by ourselves. We, you are never, you know, the, the Word of God says that, that the Lord said He will never leave you nor forsake you. The Holy Spirit will be with you and He is in you. And um, that's what a true Christian looks like. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse 14. What does it say there? 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Because you have given yourself away to the Lord Jesus Christ, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, do not be bound, it says, together with unbelievers. What does that mean? Well, first of all, you clearly, you know, it's talking about you're not to be tied with them. In other words, there shouldn't be a marriage between an unbeliever and a believer. You're not to be bound with them. And, uh, and you have to be careful. And so be careful with that. Do not be bound together with unbelievers for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness and what fellowship has light with darkness. What's the context here? The context is there are false teachers in the Corinthian church. And they're allowing them to teach and they're mingling with them. And Paul is saying, look, you're, you're being bound together with these unbelievers. You ought to be booting them out. And so he says, what partnership do you have? What partnership does light and darkness have? None. And so he's calling them out. Now, we use this many times in, in other areas, but that's the context. And he goes on and makes it even stronger. Verse 15, and what harmony has Christ with Belial? Another word for another word for the devil. Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Now, can we love unbelievers? Absolutely. We're not to be bound to them, right? Be careful. You are to be bound, you're bound to Christ, first of all. Verse 16, oh, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said. I will dwell in them and walk among them. This is right out of, second, uh, right out of Exodus. I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Here he's talking about Israel. Verse 17, therefore, he says, come out from their midst and be separate. What is he talking about? He wants Israel to be set apart from the world. Paul is using this, telling the Corinthian church, you need to be set apart from these false teachers. Get out from among them. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. Verse 18, 
I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. And so, beloved, we see here that there needs to be a separation. Now, he's not saying you should go outside of the world, right? We live among people that, that uh, don't love the Lord, that actually are hostile towards the Lord. You have to work. You have to go to the store. You have to do these things. You're surrounded with people who do not know the Lord. But you're not to be bound together with, with an unbeliever if you can't help it, right? And, uh, and in this situation, they have these unbelievers in the church, infiltrating the church and even teaching. And Paul is saying, no, you got you to separate yourself from these people. So he assures them, first of all, that they are saved, but they also need to understand that they are temples of the living God, and they need to live a life that is holy and set apart. Colossians chapter 1, go with me there. Colossians 1, we see Paul's purpose in his ministry. And his purpose in ministry is to call people to faith in Jesus. So I just want to warn you and let you understand that, you know, um, who you're with, your friends and everything, be careful that they do not influence you, but you influence them. Remember, we are to be the light and salt of the earth. Understand that? We're to be light and salt. Just be very careful because the Bible is very clear that bad company does what? Corrupts good morals. You need to be as Christ. Even though Christ ate with sinners and he spoke to them, he was not influenced by them. He was the one influencing them. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. What does it say there? Paul says to the church in Colossians, and, and he had never met the church, by the way, but he's heard about them and the false teaching that was going on there, and he heard about the things they're doing right, things they're doing wrong, and he wants to show them that when it comes to Christ, Christ is superior to all things. He is the one that we, we are to uh, worship and glorify. He goes on to say in Colossians 1, Now I rejoice in my sufferings, he says, for your sake, because Paul himself had been persecuted for his preaching and teaching and, and bringing many people to Christ. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do not... I do my share on behalf of his body, which is a church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. If you met the Apostle Paul, you would say, what happened to that guy? I remember there was a, a man in our church back when I was in seminary, and he had gotten beaten up by a gang. And he, uh, his face had, had these scars, and he couldn't even talk right. He, his, his mouth was crooked, and he talked really like this, almost like Rocky Balboa or something, you know. And it was because they beat him up so badly, and they left him for dead. And so when you meet him, like, what happened to that guy? And I guarantee you, if you saw Paul and the scars, remember, Paul was shipwrecked. He was beaten with rods. He was stoned and left for dead. So Paul had literal scars on his body for Christ. And so Paul says, I rejoice. Because Paul knows he's going to have a new body. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is a church, and filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your behalf so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That's Paul's ministry. That is the mystery which has been hidden from past ages and generations but has now been manifested to the saints. What is this mystery? What was this mystery that was hidden? Verse 27, to whom God will to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among Gentiles. And what is it, beloved? It's Christ in you. See, that's different than the Old Testament, isn't it? We see it's the Holy Spirit in you. It's the Spirit of God in you. Here, here's the mystery. Christ in you by the Holy Spirit. This is the mystery. And God has will to reveal that now in this, in this new covenant. 
And this is the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And now Paul began to share his whole ministry. This is what he does. And he uses the word we, verse 28. We proclaim him, Christ, teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose, Paul says, I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. So Paul works hard to bring, to share the word of God, to bring people to Christ. It's kind of part of the holy priesthood, isn't it? You want to bring people to Christ. You want to, you want to be able to bring, uh, represent God to people. Kind of the high priestly, uh, a high priest function. Yet Christ is ultimately our high priest. And so, beloved, we see here then um, that the Holy Spirit dwells with us and mightily works in us, as he says with Paul, and it's Christ in us. Do you understand that Christ lives in you? Did you know that Second Peter says that we are partakers of the divine nature? Isn't that amazing? That the Holy Spirit, remember that when you're born again, not only are you made alive spiritually, but God's Holy Spirit comes and lives in us permanently. We saw the beginning of that at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles. That's called the permanent indwelling Holy Spirit of God that's with us, Christ in us. You ever wonder why you have the sensitivity to the things of sin? I remember talking to a young lady and I, I shared the gospel with her and, and, and she wanted to accept Christ there where, where I was working and, and she went home and, and she went about her business and I don't know what she did, but she did something wrong and she felt such a conviction and she said, she, she, we're talking, she goes, I was like, oh, what happened to me? She says, what did Daniel do to me? I didn't do anything to her. I shared the gospel with her. But what happened was she understood the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the grieving of the Holy Spirit. And, and so you and I need to understand that once you are truly born again, you have the Holy Spirit of God living in you. You can't do the things you want to do because you will grieve the Holy Spirit of God. You ever wonder when you do things why you have this conviction? Now, unbelievers have conviction, but how much more you and I will have the true Holy Spirit of God living in us? So, beloved, understand this. Whatever you see, whatever you do, the Holy Spirit is right there with you. So let me ask you, are you honoring God with your body? Are you honoring the Lord? Or are you grieving the Holy Spirit? Be careful. Sometimes we even say the wrong things. Be careful. Use your tongue for edification. Your body, everything belongs to the Lord. And I don't know if you ever said that prayer, but sometimes we need to just once again just reiterate to God, Lord, take my eyes, take my mind, take my heart, take my hands. Lord, take my body. I surrender everything to you. It's good to say that. I mean, I think we need to do that. And uh, I mean it from our heart. Let's go back with me to Romans 8. Let's, let's look at the last part here. First of all, we do see the contrast between the unredeemed flesh and those who are redeemed. I hope that you have a new heart. I really do. I hope that you have a new life and a new love. Uh, I hope that you do have the Holy Spirit living in you. And, um, and one way you know that is that you, uh, you love the Lord and that you're a temple of God. Verse 11 is another wonderful truth and promise. In verse 11, Romans 8, verse 11 says this, But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That's a promise of the resurrection. Not just a promise of the resurrection, but the promise of the resurrection of life. You have to understand that. So that's a commitment. 
Not only that, do you understand that the Holy Spirit that you have right now living in you, how much power that is? There is a lot of power that's living inside of you. Do you ever wonder, and, and I use this verse, I remember talking to this young man who was having problems with pornography. And, and I was talking to this young man, and I showed him this verse, and I showed him, look, you have the Holy Spirit of Christ living in you. You can say no to sin because you have all this power living in you. The Holy Spirit of Christ can give you the strength to say no. And we have to know that. And so remember that when we sin, we purposely sin, but we have the Holy Spirit of Christ in us. Beloved, that's a lot of power. That's, a, that's the same Spirit that resurrected Jesus from the dead. That's the Spirit that's living in us. We're not weaklings is what I'm saying. We're not weaklings. We have a, a new Spirit. We, God has given us uh, and caused us to be partakers of His divine nature. So important for you to understand this because this will give you victory over sin. And so we see then that someday the Lord will raise us up. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 15 on the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15. You know, the truth is every single person is going to be resurrected, but not in the same way. There's a resurrection of the just, and there's a resurrection of the unjust. That's John chapter 5. You want to be a part of the resurrection of the just. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul kind of shares with us and describes just a little glimpse of this. 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 42, Paul talks about the resurrection. We're going to put on, have a new body, beloved. We're going to have a new body. And how do we know this is true? Because we have a down payment. Or as the Word of God says, we have a pledge. And what is that pledge? The Holy Spirit of God. He's like, in a sense, the engagement ring, right? Of something to come. But even more powerful than that. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 42, uh, 15, verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the body. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. So your resurrected body is going to have glory and it's going to have power. Look at verse 44. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Jesus is the first fruit, isn't he? When Jesus resurrected, did he resurrect in a phantom? Did he float around as a, like a, like, just like a ghost? No. Jesus, in the book of Luke, says, do you have any food here? And he began to eat in front of them, remember? And he told, uh, remember he told Thomas, put your finger here and stick your hand here? He resurrected in a body, but it was a spiritual body. You and I will also have a body. And so it's important we understand this. We're not going to be floating around like ghosts. Um, verse 45. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last man became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are uh, earthy. And as the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. We're going to have a perfect heavenly body, just like Christ. Christ right now is at the right hand of the Father in a body. Do you understand that? When he was ascended into heaven, again, he did not ascend into heaven as a spirit, but in a body. Right now, Christ is at the right hand of the Father in a body, spiritual body. And someday we will have a spiritual body like Christ. That's the promise. We have God's pledge, don't we? 
and the pledge and the guarantee is the Holy Spirit that lives in you. Remember, God has made us new crea a new creation, right? We have a new heart, a new mind, but we still have this old body and the presence of sin. We still have to battle that. But we look forward to our new body, aren't we? We do. Let me just close with this. Many of us know people who are nice people. We meet people that are all the time, and there's some really nice people, and many of them are not even Christians, right? You, you meet people like that. They're really nice. They seem like they're really sweet people. But I want you to understand that even though people can be kind and nice and friendly, they still need a Savior. You understand that? They still need a Savior to deliver them from the wrath of God. They can be nice and everything, and, and even people say, oh, they're a good person. Oh, I think if that person dies, they're, they're a good person. They should go to heaven. No. Understand, only God truly is good. So no amount of good deeds from nice people could ever cleanse them from the sin, right, that they have committed. Their goodness and their kindness could never atone or pay for their sins. You understand that? Man's greatest need is the forgiveness of God. And, and Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6 says, All our righteous deeds are as what? Filthy rags. Now, they can be nice and sweet, but that's not going to take away their sin. That's not going to cleanse them. And that's what man needs. Everybody needs a Savior. Everybody needs a forgiveness of God. Because everyone has sinned against a holy God, has broken his commandments. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. As nice and sweet as people can be, they still need the Lord. Remember that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners from the wrath of God. And that's why Christ came and he suffered and he died as the Lamb of God. He died a substitutionary death for sinners. On the third day, he rose again in power. And so, beloved, we have to share that message with these, even the nice people, right? You might think, well, they're so nice. They still need the Lord. They're still going to die in their trespasses and sin. You might think, oh, you know, this other person, he's so bad. He really needs the gospel. They all need the gospel. The Bible says in Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed for a man to die once, and after this is judgment. Beloved, God calls every man, every woman to repent and to trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you cried on the Lord, cried to the Lord and asked him to save you? Have you done that? Are you saved? That's important. It's important to ask the Lord to save us. We need to do that, don't we? If you haven't done that, I invite you to do that. Well, let's pray, and I'm going to ask Brother Steve to come up and to share some things in the bulletin. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your precious word. Lord, we all need a Savior. We have all sinned against you. We have all fallen short of your glory. We thank you that you are a holy, righteous, and perfect God. Lord, we respect that. We thank you so much, Lord, for not leaving us in our trespasses and sins, but you sent your Son 2,000 years ago. You sent your divine Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. He came and lived a holy and perfect life. And then he was taken by sinful men and hung on a cross. He was buried, and on the third day he rose again, conquering the grave. And now, Lord, we know that by your grace alone, by faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we can be forgiven and saved. Thank you so much for saving us, Father, and giving us what we don't deserve. Now we ask your blessing upon us, and we thank you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. If you don't have a bulletin, raise your hand. We'll get one to you. It's like everybody has. We have some birthdays this week. One of them is Mike Tamello. His birthday is today. He's not here today, but when you see him, Tuesday. Okay, well, Tuesday then. So I was told today, but that's all right. Tuesday. And also we have Dina Haas.
Birthday's on Wednesday. All right. Happy birthday, sister. Sunday evening, our pastor's preaching out of the book of Acts, chapter 12, verses 1 through 17. Peter's deliverance. We start at 6.30. Come out and join us, folks. Praise and prayer, 6.30 Wednesday nights. We uh, have a praise and prayer time. Uh, pastor preaches a short devotional, and uh, we have a good time of uh, praise and prayer. Lots to pray about, and lots to praise the name of the Lord for. Friday night Bible studies continue, uh, March 26th, 6.30. We have a little food and fellowship, and then we come in here for a Bible study at 7. So come out and join us all. All Everybody's in, invited. Our quarterly business meeting will start right after the morning worship, so uh, please stick around for that. We will begin five minutes after the meeting starts. Uh, there is no nursery, so uh, your children will have to stay with you. We have an outreach opportunity. Our brothers Mario and Coronado and Tommy Haas are going to Heritage Park. Is this every Saturday, Mario? Eventually? Okay. So if you have any questions about that, you can talk to, to Mario or Tommy Haas, and uh, they will get you hooked up, and they would be glad to have uh, lots more folks come out and join them. Uh, it starts uh, next Saturday, the 27th at 2 p.m. Do you guys meet here, or do you meet at the park? Okay. So I should have had you just stand up and talk about it. So. All right. Uh, we're having Masters University Choir come and visit us on uh, May the 14th, and uh, we're asking for folks to volunteer maybe to put up a student for one night, right? And for that, uh, if you have any questions about that, you can talk to Miss Elizabeth, and she will uh, um, put your name down. Prayer request, lift up our church, our ministry, our pastor and his family, replacing the trailer in the back, our parking lot, the financial needs of our church, our country, our military, our law enforcement, our first responders and the persecuted church. Uh, Alessandra Ozuna is asking for pictures of military veterans. She wants to make a collage of all of our veterans that belong to our church. So see her and bring her a picture. And uh, we got one of our brother Roy back there. You wouldn't even recognize him. He's so young in that picture. So <laughs> I think all of us veterans would uh, look a little younger and wouldn't recognize us. So nursery workers are needed. So if you would like to participate in that, you can see Rose Ozuna, and we're seeking volunteers to clean our church. So uh, there's a sign-up sheet for that in the hallway. Uh, prayer and financial support. We're still asking for prayer for our brother Mario and for financial support for him through seminary. If you can participate in that, it would be greatly appreciated. Online giving, you can follow the prompts in your computer and donate to FCF. So keep track of that. If you do that, just keep track of your contributions for tax purposes. Pastor? Uh, again, we want to invite you to um, uh, participate with us. As we're going to have the Masters, uh, it's called the Masters Chorale, which is uh, the uh, the choir from the Masters University, and we do need houses to uh, have them to stay one night, and uh, we're going to try to feed them dinner here and hopefully breakfast here um, and send them on their way. So if you can help take a couple of students in, that would be great. I think it would be a great blessing for you. You might say, well, pastor, I don't have a bed. Well, if you have a nice soft carpet, they have sleeping bags. So please consider uh, taking someone in. It's May the 14th. So please consider that. We really need um, uh, them to have a place where they can where they can uh, rest and they can shower. And uh, otherwise, we're going to have to put them here, and, and that's going to be tough. Also, we do have a baptism coming up next Sunday night. I want to encourage you to come out. Uh, Brother Martin and Sister Anna are going to be baptized. Amen. So, and if you uh, want to consider being baptized, please let me know as soon as possible. And um, uh, what a great step. Well, let's bow our heads. Let's all stand together for prayer. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Father, thank you so much for bringing us out this morning. We thank you for your great mercy and love. Father, thank you for your permanent indwelling spirit that will never leave us or forsake us. We're so grateful, Lord, that we are redeemed and born again. And I ask that you please uh, open those hearts, Father, who are not yet saved. 
And Father, we are so grateful for the forgiveness that we have through Jesus Christ. Now we ask your blessing as we depart. Lord, fill us with your peace and your joy. And we ask now your grace as we depart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.